I'd like to wel welcome Alec back. He's been down on the on the border. I think he can speak Spanish now. Oh, would you get my cushion back there? Welcome back, Alex. Uh, he was helping uh, fellow Ukrainians escaping and coming to Mexico to try to come in and uh, needing a place and being refugees, but they're not Hispanic, so it's kind of clogging up the way. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, be in prayer. That's something we need to constantly be in prayer about. Our government is not necessarily favorable to them coming in as it is to others coming in. So would you please pray that, that, that they can learn the magic words, you know, the Hispanics that are coming across from South America and all that stuff, there's different type of lawyer places where they're taught and instructed of the keywords to say that they're persecuted, that they're refugees, that they're fleeing for their life, and so forth and so on. And as a result, they have a right to claim refugee status here in America. But the Ukrainians come, and uh, they don't know the right words to say and so they're stifled with paperwork from the government, from Biden, of you gotta have, well, your medical records, your hospital records, you gotta have this. But if you're Hispanic, you don't have to have any of those. So would you please pray? Can we pray right now about that? Father, there is a people that's really in need of intervention on your behalf. All odds are against them right now, so I ask, O oh God, that you would intervene and send the right minds and the right people and the right attorneys to teach them the right words to come in just like other peoples are coming in from other nations. Since the gate is open, oh, open it for those who are truly in need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Got a question for you. Uh, do you think that, I know Russia is attacking Ukraine right now, so do you think we need to send them a supply of Tootsie Rolls and grain and uh, how about some fuel and uh, how about some new artillery? Uh, most of theirs is getting destroyed. <laughs> do you think we need to ship that to them? Russia? Hello? To Russia? Send, yeah, to Russia. No. Why? They don't have any right to it because they're doing something evil, right? And uh, the Ukraine is the innocent ones in this. Now, I realize there was a lot of corruption over there, but it's got nothing to do with Russia. It has to do with Russia just wants their land. They just want their land. Why am I saying this? Because in our relationship with God, God has lots of good things to say to those who belong to him and he has lots of shipment of supply for those who belong to him, that love him, and will do things for him for his purposes. If your purpose is for you and your life, you can tell that. Look at your bank account. My bank account, probably 80% of it goes to doing ministry. What's your bank account go to? If it goes to you, then... How are you going to get your ticket into heaven when you were sent here to be one of God's delegated agents? I mean, there's some people in Texas that have been supporting my coming up here and this church now for going on 12 to 14 years. They're doing without. Well, I'm not going to say without. They're doing without their tithe. They're doing without their gifts. Why? They send those because they wanted to help establish a church here. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So we have for years taken out of my personal ministry that I've had for years to pay rent for the church, to take care of the needs, buying the carpet, the chairs, and all that stuff. But who is the supplier? God is. But who else is a supplier? Remember, the body is supposed to supply all that the body needs. Every joint will supply. But however, 
if you are all about yourself, you're not going to supply that which others need. And when you get to God, he's going to ask you, why didn't you supply? I sent you plenty, didn't I? Why, why didn't you supply? Now, I'm not going to talk about tithing and all that stuff. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to say we're going to be talking about good things of the way God feels about people that will make their purpose that they're going to lay down their life for him and his kingdom here on this earth. Lay down their pleasures. One of the biggest heart attacks pseudo-Christians can have is become a pleasure puffball. Like a little dandelion floating off. Got to get my pleasure. I'll go over here and go over. And that happens, you know, when, we, when, when we're rolling in the dough. All of a sudden, we become self-centered and we're off doing everything for ourselves. And the reason I say this, because we're going to be covering lots of passages of Scripture that people will say that serve themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. That's me. That's me. It can be you. It can be you. What's so wrong about that it can be you? Why would you be insulted if I say it can be you? Because there would be a little rub under the saddle that you're not doing it God's way. And if you're not doing it God's way, what benefits are you cut off from? Not from God's standpoint, but from your standpoint by not doing what you're supposed to do. Now, I can say most of y'all here are real doers. Real doers as far as ministering in the church, doing music, doing the kids things, doing food. And so I'm not blasting you about that you haven't, unless you haven't. You can consider it a rebuke from the Lord if you haven't, because your brothers and sisters are contingent upon you being a part of the body. But since I'm going to be covering such magnificent scriptures from our Lord about his intent and his mind, the world has assumed it automatically applies to them. Pseudo-Christians assume that it automatically applies to them. It can, if they'll get in the right position. I asked you a trick question. Does Russia deserve that I ship them artillery and all the same things? Why? They're not in compliance with anything that would be right before God or even humankind. And not only that, they're threatening to turn on the toaster oven on everybody. Pretty typical of fear mongers control freaks that want to rule the world, starting with their own people. They don't care if they starve them to death. They don't care if they, how many get blown up just as long as they achieve the powerhouse grab of those that are the kings in the Communist Party. There are kings in the Communist Party. I don't know if you know that or not. Now, I, I'm not wanting to talk about Russia, but I'm wanting to digress into the fact that the wicked or those who compromise don't have access to the things I'm going to talk about. If you haven't completed your role with God in the duties that you have in this common life, then some of these things aren't yours, but they can be. Now, you can either get mad at me or you can get sad and suck your thumb. And say, oh, he says I don't have that. Well, stupid, get with it so you can have those. I'll throw it right back in your face. The reason being, God died, Jesus died to make these provisions. And those provisions are not from the, for the fool that will say, I'm doing it my way. I have a friend that I really love that is lost as a goose, doesn't know he's headed to hell, thinks he's headed to heaven, while he drinks himself to death and drugs himself to death 
and spends all of his money and all of his time in the bars. But I'm okay with God. Isn't that sad? It is for me and it is for the people that love him. It's really sad. But he truly believes that. Most Christians that are weak-kneed, jelly-spined, that don't want to do what God has to say, miss the life that God has for them, the identity that God has. And so they have to slide over to being a person that's filled with themselves, a person that's filled with bitter and hate and anger, a person that's filled with pleasure. All those are substitutes of the joy that God could give you if you would do it his way. It's real simple to do it his way. It is not hard. The hard part is for you not to do it your way. And the hardest part is for you not to lie to yourself, to tell yourself something different than what's in Scripture. You, Jackie, would you come here? Court is in session. Please play the reel of this girl. You may sit down. Every one of us are going to face that. And you tell me why you didn't want to do it his way. You won't be able to lie when you're standing there. And you'll see the flames coming up and you'll see those going ahead of you being cast into that place because of their self-willness. I hope this frightens you. I'd rather you be frightened and get your act straightened out than I would to see you cast into the lake of fire. I'm a shepherd and I'm going to see lots of people that came in for a little while, decided to be a goat, came in for a little while, did their own thing, got all filled with pride. And I'm going to see people that did not want to do the simplest projects of life to fulfill the role of what God created them for. I'm going to watch as those are pointed towards the flames that you can see halfway across heaven. I'm one of his little shepherds, and he's trying to relay to you that he has great things for you if you will just determine in your heart, use your strong will to cast down your will to do what Jesus did and say, not my will anymore. Yours, Father, your will and your will alone, not my will. If you don't cast your will down, your will and you are going into the lake of fire. If your wife, you better be a good one. You're going to be judged about that. If you're a kid, you better be a good one. You're going to stand before the throne, and you too, if you do not follow God's instructions, will be thrown into the lake of fire. However, good news, if you follow the instructions of God, the big gates will open into this beautiful kingdom with angels. Pseudo-Christians don't believe that they have any responsibility to be obedient to the words that God has spoken. Now that I'm all uncomfortable and everything, how about we slide over into, because these are not things God wants to do. He tries to cut us off and help us away from those things. We're the ones that insist that we want our way. You can have your way. You can be lazy in this life. You can get up when you want, go to bed when you want, do what you want. But when it comes to heaven, it's over. You don't get a second chance. You've made your choice. Getting up this morning was part of that choice. Getting up yesterday, there's a historical record that's being kept by an all-powerful God that we are going to stand in front of. And it's going to be a terrifying thing if we have not attempted to accomplish the tasks and duties that God has laid us in this life to accomplish. I consider all that I own 
my lords. There are several times in my life he's asked me to liquidate all to do something for him. Yes, Master. And Jackie, she'd been right alongside me. She said, yes, Master. But you know who else was right alongside us? We've got to see the Lord, our Master, come day after day, year after year, to lead us. We have an eternity to live in a great palace. We have an eternity to walk with God. We have an eternity to count the riches that we're storing up here by us giving away and us going through the pains of life. We're gaining riches in heaven. And if you can't keep your mouth shut, which that's a pain of life of having to keep your mouth shut, right? You know, I, I think the face would rip in half. <laughs> you know, you sew the lips up, but it'll burst out over here. What's my point? If my people, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, who are called by name, my name, my name, humble themselves. How do you humble yourself? How about you stop doing your will your way? You're not humble if you just fritter around. Frittering is a bad thing in Scripture. Frittering means you do things your way and you control everyone around you to do things your way. For your comfort, your happiness, for your future. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What are wicked ways? Hamatari? Sin? Let's rephrase that so we can classify ourselves. If my people who are called by my name seek my face and turn from their bow and arrow missing the mark on purpose. A bow and arrow is, he gave you money, he gave you life, he gave you breath. It's to hit his target to accomplish his purposes. If you used his bow and arrow to hit your targets to accomplish your purposes, I'm sorry, you're in trouble. What you forfeit is a visible, physical encounter with a spiritual God who's here on earth. You forfeit that. But good news, you can change that right now. You know, as I'm speaking to you, what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about your direct defiance, I'm not doing it God's way. See, am, am I telling you the truth of what's in here? Raise your hand if you think I am. The reason I ask these questions, I'm going to stand before God and if I'm your shepherd, I'm going to have to give an account for you. But if you're a wandering goat, I don't have to give an account for you, and I don't know what you're going to do, that no one is there to intercede for you if you were a goat. God set it up that way in Scripture, did he not? Somehow the shepherd is attached to the sheep of giving an account before God of your actions or lack of, of your resistance of your untrainability, of your lack of wanting to be responsive to his authority and his instructions, to the lack of you taking your identity and doing it his way. This, we just get one shot at this, doing it his way. Now, if you just want to slide in the gate, have an easy life, protect yourself, I wonder whether you'll make it into heaven or not. I don't care how much you say you name the name of Christ. Remember, you're being adopted into the family. And the adoption is that you do everything you can for the family. Elsewise, you're not adopted when you get there. Because you, you, you tended your family. You tended your life. You tended everything for you. So this pride thing about us living our lives for ourselves will break down the freight train that's loaded 
with all of God's goodness that could be delivered to me. It can't be delivered. If I'm Russia and I'm against God and I blow up God's plans to establish mine, and here's the problem in pseudo-Christianity. I, I can't tell you how many Christians, pseudo-Christians including, tell me, well, God did this and God did that, and they're always picking the wonderful things. And they said, the devil did this and the devil did that. They're always picking the miserable things. Well, I, I have news for you. The scripture says that you will come into your salvation by the things you suffer, Amen. not the things you gain. Yeah. And if you got yourself in a position that you don't have to suffer and you're all comfortable, you're king of the hill. Several years ago, somebody asked me the definition of a rich man. I said, well, the true definition is somebody that has enough, but they do nothing with it, with God. The true definition of a rich man is somebody that's self-reliant, because I've met poor people that are self-reliant and filled with pride. They think they're rich. I've met people that think they know this. They think they're rich, but they don't live it. They don't act it out. You can look at a calendar. You can look at their checkbook, and you can see from those two things. I keep bringing those up because those are the first instruments, the gas gauge on the dash, right? And the red, the red line, the hot water thingy bobby there, you know, and the steam coming out of the hood. Those are the first things you look at. The oil pressure? How's your oil pressure? That's, see, that's the amount of the Holy Spirit that you follow. And if you're not following the Holy Spirit, you got zero oil pressure. Now, that could be a big problem. So, he's making a statement here that if you will turn from your own actions of missing the mark... Did you know you can't lead yourself? Scripture says you're supposed to be led by shepherds. Did you know that? Now, see, the world hates that. Except the false shepherds. How is it that the world and pseudo-Christianity can, can accept and embrace a false shepherd? I, I know of one out this way that smokes cigars and drinks and says, you know, get on the bandwagon and all for homosexuality. Now, they can embrace him. You're, you're our shepherd. But when it comes to hearing the real word of God, there, because it's going to trouble our flesh. <laughs> Every prophet that came to town, the people in town, the kings would come and, oh, is, is that you? You troubler of the people. <laughs> Did you know they said that to Elijah? You troubler of the people. When it was the king and it was the people that were giving God trouble, and it was the people and the king that wanted to strip God of his land, of his people. So I think I've hopefully talked enough about that these things are for you if you're willing from this moment on to admit, Lord, I keep missing the mark. But this day on, I want to hit the mark. All I have is yours. All I am is yours. All my life is yours. Because anything you withhold from him gets to go to the pit, the fiery pit. You realize that. It's whatever you withhold goes to the fiery pit. And if you're attached to what you withheld, you go with it. Your record will be reviewed. The gavel will be tapped on his desk. He said, if you will turn and seek my face and turn from your hamatari or wicked ways, then I will hear you from heaven and I will forgive your missing the mark and I will heal your land. There's a process here of you have to recognize if you're not doing everything in your life for God, in God, to God, you'll have to give an account to him as to why. Are you in agreement with me on that? Isn't that what the Bible says? Everything we are, we are supposed to belong to him as a slave that he bought. He's willing to buy you. You're on the auction block, and you keep raising the ante and joining Satan. 
Come on, Satan, here. I got an extra uh, 50, 50, 50 grand here. Uh, uh, you know, give me, give me some more so I, can, so I can buy myself. See, if you buy yourself, you think you don't belong to Satan, but that's where you got the money. And if you buy yourself, then Jesus can't buy you with his blood. Would you agree with me? He's wanting to buy you on the auction block. There's going to be an auction block day when we get to heaven. A courtroom. It's who do you belong to. You're the one that makes that decision by your actions or lack of actions of who you belong to. But God, his magnanimous heart, is willing, if you're willing to turn from the wicked ways that aren't towards God. Anything that's not marching towards God for God's purposes... Now, here's the thing. I meet people all the time. Well, this is for God, and that's for God. And I, yeah, well, you liar, that's for you. Now, I don't mind you having something. Would, would you at least not lie to me? Would you at least not lie to yourself? I wanted this, so I took it. I wanted the Bentley, so I bought it. I wanted the ice cream, so I ate it. Don't tell me God gave you the ice cream. Not when you're as big as I am. Right? See, there's some telltale signs. Maybe I, I'm not... And I, didn't, I never say God gave me the ice cream. I never say it showed up by accident. I t at least tell the truth to myself that Alicia goes to the store. She calls me, uh, Dad, you want anything? You want some ice cream, Dad? Cherry Cordell ice cream, Dad? <laughs> okay. That's not her fault. See, I'm still being tested... Terry Cordell, I'm telling you. We need to get in a disposition of receiving his forgiveness, but we can't get his forgiveness unless we turn from our all-out attempts to serve ourselves and call it God. Do you realize how that stinks? Boy, that's a skunk. If you're living for yourself, everything around you is for you and your comfort. Now let's go on here, because God wants to make it clear that if we will at least see, shouldn't there be tears shed if we make that discovery? Shouldn't our head be hanging, oh God, I've been doing that day after day, year after year, week after week, and calling it you. If you can truly hang your head and maybe even get some tears in your eyes, and accept the responsibility that's your current position. You can't change your position unless you accept the responsibility that's your current position. But if you can accept the responsibility, that's where you currently stand on. Not being a whole servant of God, serving yourself. Because if you're not a servant of Him, which most pseudo-Christians say they are, but they serve themselves. So y'all ready to break over in something refreshing, maybe? <laughs> I've been holding my breath for 20 minutes, Pastor. <laughs> but God makes the statement that if we will turn from those ways, I will hear from heaven. He's waiting for you to make the first move. We're his bride, and we're supposed to attract him. We're supposed to dress to attract him to come by. We're supposed to be enticing to him. We're supposed to offer him romance. We're supposed to dress for him. Too many times his bride is a walled up garden, like in the Song of Solomon. He said, you were a walled garden. There's connotations. He walked all around this walled garden and could see her in there, and she wouldn't let him in. What was she doing? She was in her heritage, her mother's garden. Meant her mother was in charge, which meant her father wasn't in charge. If it was her mother's garden, why wasn't it her father's garden? Because the woman was in charge, and she was in charge, and Jesus came. Now you think, well, I'm racking down on women. No, I'm whacking down on brides, and are we all qualified that we're supposed to be a bride? Hello? Yes. Yeah, well, you got a beard or mustache or not. <laughs> We're supposed to be the bride of Jesus. 
I want to get you and me in that position on a continual abiding basis that if I will turn from those things, you can't turn from those things unless you recognize them. And if you recognize them and smooth over and put peanut butter on it, yes, God can't do the things he states here. If you put peanut butter on it, he's, he's, he's not going to hear from heaven. And he's not going to forgive. But he's willing right now to forgive you if you're willing to say, I've been a doofus, I've done it my way, continue to do it my way. I continue to give myself hall passes and excuses for being a violator, a direct violator of his instructions in his holy word. Then God will pay attention if you want to change it. So 1 John 16, 33. In the world you have tribulation. If you're going to stay in the world, me, myself, and I do my own thing. You can put Christianese sprinkle tops on it, you know, the little sprinkle things to make it look good. But if you want to do your own thing, even if you say you belong to God, you're just going to have tribulation. You're going to give tribulation. You're going to put everybody else in tribulation if you want to remain a part of the world. The world does what it wants, when it wants, how it wants, right? So is there anything in your list, if I was to come in or you was to ask me, and will you examine my life, I would say, well, what do you want me to examine it for? Tell me how bad I am. I, I don't want to do that. How about the right question is, would you tell me how I can turn from my evil ways because I cannot see them, but yet I'm reaping a whirlwind. A whirlwind can be you given over to your sensuality. Do you realize there's a worst whirlwind that can happen if God just says, okay, go ahead, chase the moon. I'm not going to be there. So if you're going to be in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So how do we get to the point that tribulation ceases? It's by us coming into Jesus and letting him live his life through my body, not through my mouth. So many people give Jesus lip service, but unwilling to do the other service. And always just kind of just a little short. Jesus has overcome the world, and if you will come into him, that includes the world that's in you. If you will come into him, he's overcome the world. If you come into him, you're swearing allegiance to him for several reasons. One of those is, Lord, if I don't live my life in you, I have no right to enter into heaven. You realize you, you have no right to enter into heaven if you don't live your life in Jesus. Did, did you think you did? We're so foolish in our thoughts of thinking, you know, this person I dearly love thinks, thinks they're going to heaven. Thinks they're okay with God. See, here's the problem with us playing with tribulation or the world. Deception comes, and you start deceiving yourself. And you deceive yourself to where... You travel on down the road further and further from God. You know, you know how to tell if you're being deceived. Next time I ask you to do something, see if the hair comes up on the back of your neck. I'm going to say the back of the head, but some of us are short in that area. My only hope is to come into Jesus. I cannot come into Jesus except by the quantified method that he has outlined within his scripture. Would you agree with that? But he's invited me in, but on his terms. And he just laid out the terms of that. So Jesus, he's on his throne. And do you know, I love his courtroom because the same place he can condemn somebody for doing wicked, 
things, is the same place he can say, pour out special blessings to that person. They have surrendered their life to me. Send an extra few angels to that person. Somebody was giving me a count of, uh, you know, I'm sitting in my room and I often see angels. And Pastor, every time I see you, I, I see an angel on each side of you. And sometime, Pastor, when you're speaking, I, I see Jesus sitting right where you are. You think that's possible? I betcha. Yeah. If, if that's okay, I said that about you and you're the one that said that, would you raise your hands? That was Hannah, just a few minutes ago. He said, I, I see you'll be sitting there, and all of a sudden I see the Lord, and he's teaching. Then all of a sudden I see you again, and I see him again. She has spiritual eyes. You can develop those spiritual eyes. If you're a rebel, rebels can't see those things. And like Russia's a rebel to the world right now, it's got no right to have any delivery of anything from God. And quite, a, quite, a, quite the opposite, they're, they're stirring his wrath, but he's using them as a tool. So Jesus is on his throne right here, but this is the same place that he clears the courtroom of the vagabonds and the people that don't want to do it his way. And he says, okay, for the next three hours, okay, all the blessing angels, y'all come close, come close. Oh, you're the angel for Hannah. I want you to show her more angels. He passes out his blessings. Now, if you're settling for what you can get on this earth, you're missing the part that spiritual eyes could be established. Now, if your spiritual eyes aren't established and your spiritual ears aren't established, now you're going to have to cook a lot of things up that you think God's saying. And you're just going to be a blabbermouth. Not living it. Thinking that you're good and you're okay. If I could give you warning about anything. Is if you think you're good and okay. You're in terrible hot water. No, excuse me. You're in lukewarm water. Worst place you can get. Because Jesus says, I just want to hack a big loogie and blow you out of my mouth. And I hear you laughing, but I don't know. How, what, am I supposed to say something pleasant? Like, I would just spit you out of my mouth? No. He violently will. <laughs> it's that bitter of a taste to him if you want to be lukewarm. I hate to have to be a fool for him and give you a demonstration of his disregard for your disregard of him. But he offers, on the opposite scale, he offers, here's my courtroom. If you're not like that, now I can get to the business of tapping down my gavel. Gabriel, come over here. I got an assignment for you. See that little girl down there? Ah, oh, she's doing everything right before me. Would you... Would you go tell her I love her? Would you go tell him? I love his judgments. His judgments will only save my bacon, and his judgments will only bring blessings to me, and his judgments will always against, be against my flesh, and his judgments will always be for my spirit. And I think pseudo-Christianity has wanted God to bless their flesh. And he says, I, I, I don't bless that pickle factory. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is the end of the sentence? Being in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, none of those things are yours. I didn't say if you belong to him. I said if you're in him, because I meet a lot of people that belong to him, but I don't know, somehow they're someplace else than in him. Do you, do you go somewhere else besides in him? 
Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. Again, we have to back up to the first scripture, which said that God will heal your prayers if you'll come away from you missing the mark, that you were given one chance to become a child of God, and that's your lifetime of every day of it being subject. You've got just one chance of becoming his child. That's the only reason you're here on this earth is to prove up as to whether you're going to be his child. You're not here for any other reason. You're not here to serve yourself. You're not here to serve mama. You're not here to serve daddy. You're not here to serve your wife, your husband. You're here to find God and to walk with God and lay your body out and your mouth out and your mind out and your marbles out and say, here I am, O oh God. If you've chased life by the tail and been a ring-tailed tutor, you have a poor position that you're in. But if you will look at your poor position and say, no more, I only have a few years left to prove up if I'm judged on the years I've lived, I lost. Most people who are judged on the years that they lived, they didn't live them for God. You'll be judged as to whether you lived your life for God. And sadly, if God's not real to you, you're not going to live your life. You're going to have this, all these anachronisms of vocabulary. But where's Jesus? Now, I realize you can get all spooky on me, and oh, we visited a church when we first came here, and some reprobate that didn't know how to dress, he wasn't poor, didn't know how to take a bath, he, didn't, he had water, had a foul mouth, insolent of life, but thought he was a prophet in the church, teeth rotted out, has been, you could see that he rejects God in every way, shape, and form. I have a word for you. Um, <laughs> dear ones, God's not looking for you to give a word. He's looking for you to live a word. Yeah. God's not wanting you to give somebody else your opinion. God's wanting you to live what he says in the word. And here's the thing. You can get a real big dog inside going on by thinking that you've got to give everybody your biblical opinion or your spiritual opinion. Why don't you live it instead? You're a lousy witness if you're not living it. You're a lousy witness if you say you love God, but yet you're strung out on the pleasures of love, life itself. Just don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in prayer and petition. I want my prayers to be heard, not for me. I very seldom anymore. I don't think that I, 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 I did ask God one thing this last week. Other than that one thing, I can't even remember the last time I asked him for anything. He meets my needs. I don't pray over my finances. I don't pray over my cars. I don't pray over. I do. I, well, Lord, I, these, these these need help. <laughs> but my focus is not on praying over stuff. My focus is I am yours. My focus is how do I become more yours? I've had some real gastronomical problems within my head in the last couple of weeks. Do you know what they are? And Lord, I love you so much, I don't even want to go out on the boat that you sent me. I, I, I don't want to go out and anchor somewhere. I just want to be in your house. I just want to be with your people. It just really gives me a heartache. It gives me a heartache. I, I, that happens every time I go on vacation. Is that not right, Jackie? I just, oh, I, I need to be there. I, I need to be where God is. I don't like going on vacation. Although there's that euphoric thought before you go on one. I don't enjoy it. Unless, of course, the Lord says, Curtis, he was telling me today, I said, Curtis, I want to take you out there. I want to get you there with you and Jackie. 
I'll be there. Well, Lord, I know everybody else chases the wind and chases their desire. And I don't trust that I'm hearing you because I know I had a desire in the boat. But I can honestly tell you, I'd be just as happy to give you the boat or sell it tomorrow. I told the Lord that last night. I said, oh, Lord, I'm ready to bail on this. And he said, that's a good position to be in, Curtis. See, it's not your desire. As a matter of fact, it's so much not your desire that it's kind of repugnant. Therefore, I can trust you, and I'll go out on your little boat with you that I gave you. Because I know you'll be agonizing all the time that you just want to be in my presence. The peace that God has is in a cessation of all of our insatiable appetites, our sensual desires that we shower ourselves with and pat ourselves on the back and you know, I had, I had a cousin that he always had to, have, had to have a Lincoln or a Maserati or something and big shot this. And I always felt sorry for him because he said he loved the Lord. He even wanted attention of people and said, well, okay, I'm going to become a preacher. And I, he even tried preaching for a couple of years in churches. Ended up going through divorce. Spitting in God's eyes. See, it wasn't in his heart. It wasn't what he's called to. God just called him to a life to live for him. But when he did have money, money rolling out the kazooka because he was a tax consultant, made hundreds of thousands of dollars every tax season, he wasted it on himself. Bigger this, better that. Oh, did you, did you see my, I don't know what's beyond a Rolex, you know? I'll, I'll let you guys figure that out. You know, maybe he drove Rolex tires on his car. I, it, 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 it was a waste of money. Gold rims. Oh, well, I have gold rims, Curtis. <laughs> what side? He didn't have the Lord. Had a love for the Lord, but his love for the Lord wasn't as strong as his love for himself and his comfort. It's funny, out of all the cousins, out of all the money he made, out of all the years, he had to go through divorce, lost everything he had, can't get a job, and is almost penniless and can't even afford to buy a house, let alone rent. And he's about six years older than I am. But what a waste of a life spiritually. You see, well, it's a bad way to end. Well, it's a worse way to end, to end and realize you weren't spiritual by living it. So I need God to come in and I need to be with him. And if I'm with him, no matter what he asks me to do, I can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will do that. Our little pressure gauge for the oil for our, the new motor in that boat, it wasn't working when we went out the other day. And I thought, Oil pressure is a good thing to have in a diesel engine. It's a bad thing not to have. I got back to land, I realized that, holy smokes, what if it needs another engine? The Lord said, what, so? Should I break a sweat over that, or should I say, if I need to go through that, Lord, Praise God, I will go through that. See, we don't have an understanding that it's the bad things in life we need to go through to change our bad character to where we can rejoice in all things. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. If you're right with God, if you're walking with him, no matter what happens around you, joy can be yours. And what happens around you, you can see him with his, his holy baton in the air. You're orchestrating me. Oh, you're right here. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, while I've got him there 
Am I going to ask him about the oil pressure gauge or am I going to praise him and worship him and thank him because he showed me himself? Understanding that Jesus is here changes my mind and it will guard my heart from my flesh. I don't need my heart guarded from Satan. I need it guarded from my own self-will and my own pride. Will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to go through some scriptures here pretty fast, but I want you to look up and see your Lord and Master's been on the throne all day. I don't know if you know that. Anybody catch this view today before now? Hey, he's he's happy. He he thinks everything's going according to his plan. Now, what's wrong with me that I should not understand that everything is in accord. What's wrong with me if I don't understand he's, he's on the throne? If you didn't know he was on the throne, it's because you were busy about your business. I want so much for you to become sold out to the prospect of being busy about his business so you can behold your master. Because you just have a few short years left to be sold out 100% to God, and you got a bad record. I got a bad record. And if you're trying to play off your bad record and, and your excusatarian stuff, how about we wise up in this moment and say, God, you're really, really offering me a chance to change my eternity based on the short future I have left. Instead of judging me on the bad past of doing everything for myself, Mr. or Mrs. Piggy, got to have it, got to have it. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now remember, what's God's definition of love in John chapter 15? If you love me, obey me, and those who do not love me don't obey me. So when he makes the statement, we know that for those who love God, isn't he referring to those that will no longer just give him lip service, but that will die for him? Now, see, I, I meet lots of people that are spineless that, well, just die for him. He don't need you to die for him. He died for you. He needs you to live for him, dummy. He says live for him. Live life full of gusto, full of joy, full of peace, full of the Holy Spirit, full of Jesus, instead of full of yourself. He wants you to live life. Life in him. So that... All things will work for good, but for whom? For those who are called according to his purposes. If I was to examine your spiritual record up to this date, would I find that most of the things that you've done is for your purposes and put some Jesus sauce on top? You know, if we cover it with enough chocolate syrup, Surely we can call it Jesus. But as is one little shepherd, I don't have to take a spatula and rake off the chocolate. And I'm going to find knee deep, me, myself, and I, that your purposes are for you. And you have not figured out your purposes are for you. If you have a temper, it's because you want something. If you're aggravated, it's because you have the right to something. If you're frivolous with your time, it's because you don't have time for God. Because you're bored. Because you're not sold out to him. Everything in life, God wants to work it for your good. But he looks at, if I send my train of good, like if we sent the stuff that Ukraine needs on a train, and they say, well, that's great, it's coming. Uh, hey, Belize, can we sell this to you? If it doesn't have any meaning to them, God's going to see that in your heart. His spiritual stuff of knowing him and walking with him and his peace. Do you know what peace is like? When I've been on bedside of people dying, and they know they don't have two cents to buy their way into heaven. 
you'll figure out on your deathbed of how you live your life for yourself. You figure out on your deathbed that that time clock that was supposed to have hundreds of thousands of hours on it for God has maybe three hours on it. And you'll be real nervous. And you'll talk to me and you'll say, would you please tell me I'm going to be all right? And I'm going to have to tell you, I'm sorry, you're not. You don't know him. You didn't live for him. I've done that with people. I can't lie to them. You're not okay. You're fixing to perish here. And you're still in your own flesh and wanting me to tell you're okay. Why aren't you blubbering like a baby saying I'm not okay? I was wicked my whole life. I lived my whole life for myself. Dear God in heaven, I'm fixing to be transported to hell. And he is so right to do that. How do I find mercy? How do I attain mercy at this last moment? They didn't live their life for his purposes. They just put ketchup on top of their purposes and called it Jesus. Ketchup, fake blood. I meet many Christians that put ketchup on everything they do and call it Jesus. Of how Jesus provided this and how... Now you skin somebody out of it. How Jesus gave you this. No, you, you lied about it. How Jesus is doing this. No, you were just a good negotiator. Pretty rough sermon, huh? So we get to some of the good parts. Because if we do not realize the status we're in, how can we change our direction? All these sweet things that God speaks is available to us, but if it's if our purposes are for Him. See, that was the thing. I, I looked at the little boat He gave me and said, but how can that purpose be for you? I, I don't want something that the purpose is not for you. Uh, you know, He's talked to me a lot about it. He's, well, you'll be taking people out there and people will be having spiritual encounters. And, but Lord... You hear the arguments in my soul about this. Now, it's good that I have arguments of not wanting to do that. Would you agree with me? Would you agree with me that it proves that's not the desire of my heart? The desire of my heart is to serve God with all my heart, mind, soul, and body. No matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I'm with. Why? Why? Because everything I do, I want it to be about his purposes. Now, I know it doesn't give spit for your purposes. But there again, if you live for your purposes, what right do you have to trample his gates and want in if you lived your life for yourself? If Jesus died for the life that he's supposed to live within you. Is this good theology? We're supposed to work out our deliverances with fear and trembling. How can we do that unless we tremble about where we actually stand? And how can we do that unless we shout for joy of, Oh God, this day, you're offering me a different way. This day, you're offering me something different. So let's get on to that different if you decide. Here we are. We're standing there. They're going over to time clock, and they see this guy has 32 minutes invested and actually yielding his life without being distracted to God, there may be a problem. But praise be to God, Isaiah 41 and 10. So do not fear. I am with you. Now, if you're with me, myself, and I, you can't be with him. Fear not. If you're willing to make these changes and you see that yourself is one that is not sold out to all the purposes of God. Then that's the right mind to be in. And if you're in that right mind, then God says, fear not. I, I, I see your heart. I see you're ready to make that commitment. You're ready to change this day. You're ready to look at those things and say no more. You're ready to look and say I was a slob. I've lavished everything upon myself. If we're willing to be honest with ourselves and come out of our deranged mindset, we're not okay. 
The only reason I'm okay is because I want his purposes above mine. And I'm willing to yield myself. I, I have a pair of shoes I, I was thought about wearing, but I don't like wearing them. They're blue leather. And they have wide, white top tennis shoe looking sole around it and it's got brown leather on the back of it and they're slip-ons they're very comfortable and the only reason I wear those is because I look silly in them <laughs> my, my daughter bought them for me she's probably watching getting a giggle I don't like dress shoes that look like tennis shoes, but I wear them to church because it makes me hold my head down and rather than wearing a $300 pair of Italian leather shoes with tassels on them that and a preacher's supposed to wear with a $1,000 suit, and of course I'm still waiting on the $10,000 Rolex. No, I'm not. I got a Jesus X watch. I don't know what brand yours is, but mine's from heaven. I try to stay on heavenly time. So if you truly will be honest with yourself right now, and if you're not going to make excuses about tomorrow, how about you go home and burn your calendar? It's an insult to God. How dare you plan around God? You'll be held accountable when you stand there in heaven. You're, you're piling up evidence against you. It will be displayed, your calendar. Now, you, you say you, all your purposes, but let's look at your calendar. Let's look at what you do. Let's look at what you didn't do. You'll stand there in agreement with him. But if you can come to that conclusion today, and come into agreement with him today, then he says, so do not fear, for I am with you. He is not with you unless you make your purposes his. That's my whole point about the Russia thing and belaboring all this, this stuff that's like boiled eggs. They don't smell very good, do they? The thing that God has to say doesn't stink. It's us who stinks and his pleasant odors is what makes our odor of noncompliance stand out. Do you understand that? So if you smell rotten eggs, it's not God and it's not his word that's extracting that from us. It's just the, the air, a puff of perfume of his personality comes across and says, can we settle this issue? I want you every minute you have left to make your purposes mine. From the time you get up to the time you go to bed, to everything that you plan, I want you to make your purposes mine. He's watching to see if you're willing to do that. If you are, then he says, fear not, for I am with you. And don't be dismayed. And why would we be dismayed? Because all of a sudden we see all of our purposes were for ourselves. And if you say even one purpose was from God, you're a liar. If you got a hundred purposes for yourself and a thousand purposes for God, you still have a hundred purposes for yourself that are measured. You understand that? It's, it's like putting dirt in concrete. That don't work, does it, Bob? You've got to have solid rock, and you have to have solid sand. The harder the sand, the harder the rock, the harder the concrete. You put dirt in there, it's fluff. Concrete will set up, but you can just break it like that because it's not embolded together. It's not infused together. True, Bob? He's our concrete guy. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. But he, before that, he, says, he makes this statement, don't be dismayed. You're going to look at yourself, and I hope you're not dismayed because you are hopeless and I'm hopeless. But he says, for I'm your God. If I can just come into agreement with him that all my purposes have not been for him, then he'll say, don't be dismayed about that. But I'm not going to excuse it anymore. 
I'm your God, and if you're willing to commit to me the rest of your life, we have something to build on before you die. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Who's his righteous right hand? Yoshua. Matter of fact, I, I told you everywhere you read in the Old Testament where God's talking about his salvation, you know what the Hebrew word is? It's Yoshua. I will uphold you with my Yoshua. I will give you life in salvation, but the word is, I will give you life in Yoshua. I want you to look at the promised land. Israelites walked around it for about 40 years. Refused to go in it once because they had to give up me, myself, and I. And you know who the giants were in the land? That was their flesh. They didn't want to conquer their flesh. God has given you a life, and there's a promised land in that life, and a Canaanite and a Philistine has been living there. And he says, are you ready to make war against your Philistine nature? Are you ready to march in with me and take the land that, that's under your feet and become my child and make this my land? Isn't that what he told them? That he would go before them and he would establish the land? He will go before you and establish the land, but not if it's not your purpose to make him your king and your God. God kept his promise to his people when he led them into the land flowing with milk and honey. There's a kingdom of God that's right here, been here all along. Most have not entered into the kingdom because they're too busy about their kingdom and their business and their purposes. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Nivi. <laughs> that's NIV version. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagan runs after all these things. Do you, are you pagan? How many of you been running errands this week? See, After these things, that makes us pagans. Pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. See, God know I needed some shoes, and so my daughter picked me out some that make me look foolish. They're comfortable. <laughs> but seek first his kingdom. But you can't seek his kingdom unless you're going to seek his righteousness. And what is his righteousness? How did Jesus get his righteousness? By making all of his purposes God's purposes. By making God's purposes his purpose. That was where his righteousness came from. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Now, there's the problem, isn't it? See, we're like snails, and we just don't believe God can give us all those things. Well, if you're a snail, he won't. If you want to come in and be a Christian, come in and make your purposes his, he will provide for you. If you don't make his purposes yours, you have to provide for you. And unless you're a cutthroat, a thief, a horse swindler, you're going to have a pretty hard time in this life. Unless you gain some skills. But guess what? You won't have a hard time in this life if you say, here I am, Master. What would you have me do this day? Now, I, Hannah was asking me some questions about what to be in the future. Is it okay if I say that, Hannah? <laughs> and I, I, I said, you know, but you can't decide that right now. You just got to learn how to walk with God and make him your purpose this day. And then tomorrow the same thing, and tomorrow the same thing. I said, he said me try on many occupations, but it was to work character in me and some character out of me that I went through trying on those different occupations, doing those different things, and it never failed. Whatever he sent me to do, Oh, my goodness, did he ever bless my socks off, no matter what it was. He would always make companies pay me at least eight times what my colleagues were making. He would always set it up to give me eight times the bonus that they would make. Why? Because I was dedicated to his purposes. 
If I'm dedicated to his purposes, my God is going to be my provider. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. These things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. How many of you are in bed worrying about tomorrow? I mean, I, I think you personally should worry about whether you lived his purposes today. And if you're going to worry about anything, worry about whether you're going to live for his purposes tomorrow. That's the only thing you should be worried about because if you will live for his purposes, God will work out all the rest. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. It will worry for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Are you old enough that you can agree with that truth? <laughs> Romans fifteen thirteen, Nivi. That means that means it's real spiritual, right? May the God of hope fill you with all joy. If you make his purposes yours from this day forward, he becomes your God of the hope of the life that he has for you. The life he has for you will not ingratiate your flesh. Not at all. It will insult your flesh. But if you want to be rich spiritually, the life he has for you is being able to see him, to sense him. The little girl over there, she gets visitation of angels on a regular basis. Some of, else, some of you others do too. Natalie's told me about visitation she's had. Now, I'm not picking on them. I'm pointing them out because as an adult, we're going to have to run to catch up in some areas. God pours himself out to young people. We have to run after him and try to catch him. Some of us with a butterfly net. His whole purpose is that your life would be filled with joy and peace as you trust in him. Can you trust in him when you have nothing? You can it is the greatest hope of this life. I remember the Lord telling me, I want you to move out and sell these things, and I want you to live in a tent. And I said, well, I'm all for that. He said, I'll come and see you. And I said, I have a new bride. Lord, how do I explain this, that we get to be tent people? The Lord said, you just tell her, I'll come tonight, and she'll see me, and she'll hear me, and I'll speak to you all night long. He came, stood outside the tent, we listened to him for hours speaking to us. There was a green glow on the outside of this army-type tent. We'd look outside, and it's pitch black, and we'd look where the green glow is, and you can see this side, and you can see in the tent. There's no light out there. No voice out there. The voice is in here. If you're willing to sacrifice everything there is, to belong to God, God will reveal himself to you and he will give you new purposes so that you may overflow with hope. Where does that come from? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I know you're thinking, well, how do I rub two dollars together to make twelve? I hope not. I hope that you look and see the reason you're having to rub those things together it's because you're not doing his purposes his way. That means you'll always be choked back just a little bit because you're not doing it his way. He's got more than ample provision for our lives. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. If you would make it a choice that you're going to do his purposes, he says, I will hold your right hand. It's a pretty important thing to encounter that on your deathbed, by the way. So it is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. My greatest help that I need is to come out of me and to come into him. Humble yourselves, therefore, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, under 
the mighty hand of God. It doesn't say humble yourself your way. Humble yourself and wear a pair of shoes that make you look silly. It says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. If you're under your purposes, you're not under the mighty hand of God. Because if you're under the mighty hand of God, you're doing everything you can to perpetuate his kingdom, his way, through his authority, through his instructions, not your way. Uh, I have a person that used to be a friend of mine, don't know if they still are or not. Years ago, they were making a million bucks a month, excess surplus beyond all their expenses. And the most that they would give into the church, not mine because they didn't go to my church, was they set themselves up on a thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar a month salary, and they're making a million bucks profit. They went to a little country church that needed a roof, and they wouldn't even put a roof on. Country church said, "Since you're a member here, why don't we raise funds and build a new building?" He said, "Well, I might be interested in buying one of those blow-up tents for you guys." How much a month was he robbing God? $100,000 a month. But yet, he got to go distribute that as he wanted. It was God's money. It was a tithe that was supposed to go into the house of God for the priest that was there. He wouldn't do anything. Instead, he distributed it to whom he wanted so he could feel good about himself. So everybody was coming to office and patting him on the back. Oh, None of those people had ministries, but he wanted to call those ministries. And he was dishing out probably 20000 a month, robbing God of 80000 a month. I asked the Lord, Lord, should I keep telling him about this? No. He has his own purposes, and he uses me so he can feel good about himself. Of all that he thinks he's doing in my kingdom, and he's not done one thing. Not one. He'll not, I'll not give him credit for one thing. Matter of fact, I give him credit for robbing me. Because he gave away my tithe that was supposed to be brought to my house. He gave it away to places that was not my house. He wanted to say, my house was over there, and the house is over there, and the house is over there. The Lord said, a strong thing. I hold him responsible for stealing from me. If he was a magnanimous man, he should have taken it out of his pile and not mine. But instead, he wanted to take it out of my pile for his purposes so that he could glorify himself. Why didn't he take it out of his pile and steal stealing from me? Can you hear the bitterness of that and how God feels about that? Now, you may not be making an excess of a million bucks a month, but you got something far more valuable to God, and it's your body. It's your mind, and it's your life. Are you robbing him of what belongs to him? If you made your peanut butter of where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be, and you're not doing it according to this, you're robbing him. But the chief person you're robbing is yourself. Because how can God send you his peace, send you his joy? How can God keep the devil off your back when you're in bed with him with your purposes? Do, do you understand that statement? This is such an uplifting message. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time he may exalt you, Cast all your anxieties on him. What anxiety do I have? I surrender everything. Now the flesh man goes, yeah, you're going to go broke by this. You're going to try another Christian crusade. You're going to give away this and give away that. How can you give away something you didn't own if it was a tithe? And where's your mint and rue? You, do you know what that means? There's all kinds of sacrifices that the people were supposed to give, including if you had a little garden. You go out and you got mint coming up, you cut off 10% of it, and you bring it and put it in the offering basket. 
You got ten squats, you bring one of them. Wasn't it, isn't it increase in your house? There's supposed to be an increase of everything. Everything. That's not a tithe. That comes into the house. Now, again, this is not about tithing. However, if you want to see what your purposes are, if your purpose is your purposes, you will have used God for your benefit. And you're in really hot water if you use God to make yourself look good. But guess what? Good news. You can change that today. You can change that now. He offers you that he may exalt you. You cast your anxieties of, dear God, I don't know if I can kill this wicked thing within me or not, but I believe if I drink enough of your poison word, it will kill my flesh. His word is cyanide to your flesh. His spirit is cyanide to your flesh. His purposes is radioactive waste to your flesh. <laughs> and he's saying, would you drink this? <laughs> yes, Lord. I want to help him every chance I can of getting rid of my purposes. And I find daily there's new purposes. He will exhaust you. He will exalt you and cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Finally, Revelation 21, 4. If you're willing to do this, you're going to cry a little bit. But how many tears of aggravation and hate and bitterness have you cried already? How about we cry a little bit because we're giving up these things. And yes, you're going to be like a little baby that wants to suck hind tit. You've got to have your milk of your flesh. How many of you ever, well, the guys haven't, but the girls have weaned babies. And if you've seen a baby being weaned, they don't act real nice. So give yourself a week or two that you're not going to act real nice. Give everybody around you warning, I'm weaning myself this week. <laughs> well, it's going to be a month now. <laughs> But you get past it, grow in him, and he'll wipe away tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more. How would you like it? Do you realize your flesh and your actions and your purposes are death and your spiritual life with God that you could walk with him now? It's death. The death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. My greatest hope is that I can, with all my effort, try to live in his purposes. Today, tomorrow, for the rest of my life, that someday I might hear the words, I'm making all things new, starting with you, Curtis. I'll rejoice, for there's many things about Curtis I do not like. Many things about Curtis that does not match the mark. Many things about Curtis that I have to weed through to see, is that God's purpose? Why am I still having to weed through something new to find out? Is that God's purpose? You realize if you're one that panders to your flesh, and you say, I'm not doing that anymore, then you'll just pander to your flesh another way. And it will become about you, and of course, you, you serving God. But how come it goes in your bank account, not his? How come it goes in your time account, not his? How come it goes in your pleasure wagon and not his sanctuary and his altar? He's waiting. He's trying to escort you and seeing you see him. He's not far off. You don't have much time to complete the task. There's just a few days left. Psalms 121 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalms 54, 4. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that is, caress, <coughs> that we may receive mercy and find caress or grace to help in our time of need. <coughs> if you make your purposes God's purposes, these are your sworn things from him that he will do. If you do not make his purposes your purposes, you got no right to this shipment of these pleasures that are forthcoming before us. Psalms 94, 18 and 19. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, helped me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Psalms 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, you can't dwell in that unless you make him your purposes. But if you make him your purposes, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear, for I am with you. And do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you want to look these up, there are more of him saying similar things. It's for every person that makes a decision in their life to live for God's purposes, absolutely head over heels in love with him. He offers you that in this little session to surrender the goat man, the goat woman, to surrender your flesh man, to surrender your spectacular purposes that you wanted to pour ketchup on. If you want to know the truth about your ketchup poured over your life, you can ask me. I'm kind of reluctant to tell you the truth as the Lord has shown me where you stand with him when he offers you a different position. He offers you a different position today. And if you want to take that new position, you let God see your hand stretched out to him. You call upon him right now. Lord, we thank you for your kind invitation to live the rest of our life in the midst of your purposes and not ours. To live the rest of our life in love with you instead of ourselves. To live the rest of our lives without all the comfort of the world, but with the fellowship and abiding of your Holy Spirit. We reach up to you and we declare we will make our purposes your purposes this day. We'll stop floundering and start doing we thank you that if we do so you will only count from what we do this day on help us be sure footed about your purposes glorifying you your works your way and not ours in Jesus name I pray
My little one, I have seen your faith wane in recent days. I have seen you slowly take off one garment after the other that I had given you, that you had asked for, that on bended knee you repented and were filled with my Holy Spirit, and I clothed you and arrayed you with new clothing. Yet as of late, you have taken it upon yourself to take these garments and lay them aside. In my scripture, I have laid out that at the wedding feast, there will be guests seated at the table, not properly dressed. And I will spot out those guests. And I will have my servants 
take those guests and forcibly remove them from my table. Do not forsake yourself assembling together. It is a clear and honest command that I have given you many, many times. Do not forsake yourself assembling together. As you come in these next days, I will be watching how you are clothed. I'll be watching if you keep my garments on the shelf and refuse to put them on. Time is short, and my eye is becoming sharper and sharper. Soon it will be like a laser beam, allowing nothing in the peripheral, but only a very targeted spot to what I have instructed my bride to do. So do not take this lightly, my child. I care for you deeply, and you have taken it upon yourself to take off these garments, and I beg you, I beg you, child, to rethink, redress, regroup, light the fire within yourself, and come back into my full presence like you once were. Judge that this word is from you unanimously, and we praise you, O God that you would come and speak to us and draw us to yourself and that you invite us in for your goodness. Invite us to come away from our badness and into you, into your rich goodness. We thank you, Lord. We thank you.
my little ones, hear my words, please. Hear my words. I have spoken tonight about adoption and election. I have spoken about taking these things seriously and examining your life seriously before me and, and taking an account of where you are with me because I tell you, these things, listen to me, these things are second death serious. And there are untold numbers of people who will be astonished and surprised when an angelic being takes them and walks them, escorts them away from me. And there are buildings these days called churches. I don't speak there. I don't give warning. I have no business with them. But to those I love, I chastise. To those I love, I tell them the truth. And I tell you the truth. Please, please heed what was said. Please, please take an account of where you are with me. And tonight, resolve to change that. Tonight, turn your life around. Tonight, come to me and seek out your shepherd and make things right between us. Because I tell you again, I take these things second death seriously. Shall we judge this? If you believe this is from the Lord, Him speaking to us in prophecy, would you raise your hand? Would we accept your word as 100% your word? And we will hide these things in our heart. And oh, help us and empower us to abide and to give up our purposes. That you are our purpose from this day forth. In Jesus' name, amen.
gave us a good layer cake this night and if he spoke something into your heart that you'd like to declare I'm changing my purposes I'll give you just a few minutes to do that anybody first up to bat Alex need a microphone runner please there are many areas I rob God uh, and but I think I've noticed that I not just rob him, but I rob myself in, and there is a couple of areas that were shown for me today that I want to change, and I will surely do the necessary steps. That my calendar is an insult to God, and I should burn it. Um, many years ago, I think it was 30 years ago, I did something to please the church that I was going to at that time. And I really, my heart wasn't in it. But when you get back from uh, Mexico, I want to be baptized. I'm so shocked. <laughs> I didn't expect him to say that. Um, this is one of those messages that just hurts so good, you know? It's like, you know that, yes, it's painful to the flesh, but I needed to hear that, you know, and I needed to recommit myself and, and remember where I have left my first love and go back and do the things I did at first. So thank you. Yes. I am just so delighted to be able to sit in the presence of a God that's willing to chastise me, to move me forward, not backwards, never backwards always forward I have something if nobody else does it's Anna's birthday so we should sing happy birthday to Anna yeah. yes happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear Anna happy, happy birthday Happy birthday, Anna. Anna, it has been my joy. You are such a peaceful creature of the Lord. My goodness, I look out and I see this little wave of peace in you on your surfboard all the time. Just <laughs> quietly, it's a skateboard, I know. <laughs> I thank you for being a part of us. You are a true joy to watch you mow the grass just quietly and slowly. Always, always just loving the Lord. Thank you for being a part of us. Amen. Anyone else want to make a comment? We need a microphone runner, please. <laughs> 